Hello there. Welcome to the second of our three Lent reflections. The first one looked at how God loves us all by considering the four major promises that God made to his people. First to Noah after the flood, that he would not destroy all life again. And then to Abraham, that God would make Abraham's descendants a great nation. Now, both of those promises are unconditional. God promises them and makes no demands on his people. The third promise is different. We call that the Ten Commandments. The promise to Noah is just to one person. The one to Abraham is to a family. And God now makes a promise to all the people. And this promise is different. It has conditions attached. Yes, the people can face the future confident that God will be with them, but God does expect them to agree to the ten statements he makes to them. And on that day, all the people do agree. And the fourth promise is made to King David, that a royal king from his line will reign forever. God loves us so much that he makes this promise to be with us forever through the royal line. The story moves on and the people of God find themselves hundreds of years later back as captives in exile, wondering just where God is. And Malachi reminds them that they didn't get on too well with keeping their agreement to uphold God's commandments. But don't worry, the prophet says, God doesn't leave you, but he can't really be with you until the relationship is repaired and he will send a messenger to help you and as Christians we believe that God loves us so much that he sends John the Baptist as a messenger to tell us that someone special the Messiah will come soon and sure enough God does send the Messiah his name is Jesus and God makes sure that we know he is his son with whom he is well pleased Jesus shows us how we should live, but God loves us so much that the Bible tells us Jesus did amazing things to help us. And today we look at perhaps the most marvelous intervention that God could have made. He sends his son, yes, who is backed by his full authority. He sends his son to bring us back to God by shouldering both sides of the promise he made with his people. Not just keeping his, God's part of the bargain, but restoring us to be acceptable to him too. This reflection is called Jesus died for us and in our place. And this reflection paves the way for the third Lent reflection later on in March when we can see that because of God's love, we can have hope for the future. So let us this time gather and reflect on the story that runs throughout the whole Bible as we worship God. Remember, back with Moses, The people had promised God that they would do everything that the Lord had said that day. And later they cry out, why, O Lord, why are all these difficult things happening to us? Where is God with all his promises? And the prophet Malachi at the end of the Old Testament did have the job of explaining some simple truths to God's people. I will tell you why, he says. 
because of your unfaithfulness to God and people, even going as far as wondering aloud whether or not the God of justice even exists. Shall I tell you something else? He is coming to the temple. Behold, I send my messenger who will prepare the way before you. Now much happens in the 500 years between Malachi's message at the end of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament with the Gospels. The promises he made, though, back in the Bronze Age still hold true, even after all those years. And Christians believe God did send a messenger to underline just how much he loves us. But even better, we find in the Gospels that God loves us so much that he intervenes himself in the life of his creation by sending Jesus to explain how he expects his kingdom to work. And Mark starts his story of God intervening in love like this. And so, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. They were confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the River Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth. He came from Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming out, out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus we now know is the Messiah. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. I will send you out to fish for people. How does that even work? The disciples probably wondered. For the prophets, Jerusalem was the center of everything. And since amazingly God had identified Jesus as his son, the people around him knew he would make his way to Jerusalem at some point in his ministry. And he doesn't disappoint. All the Gospels devote a large chunk of space to describing his trip to Jerusalem and what happens there in the final days of Jesus on earth. Matthew writes, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. The gospel writers had found in the book of Zechariah this passage, which seems to be the prophecy that they spoke of as Jesus entered Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will proclaim 
peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now we see what kind of Messiah Jesus is. He is a surprising Messiah. He is hum humble and happy to ride into the central city, Jerusalem, on a donkey. And later, Matthew captures a conversation between Jesus and some people around him. They ask a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We often hear these commandments called new, don't we? Yet they are both straight from the Torah the law, the Old Testament, that the people of God had agreed to uphold way back in the time of Moses. We read in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And in Leviticus we read, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus is a humble, Torah-abiding Messiah. And throughout the Gospels, we hear of Jesus helping others. In the first reflection, I emphasize Jesus' desire for fairness when a woman was condemning, condemned to a stoning by men who were hypocrites. Treat everyone the same, said Jesus. Uphold the Torah. In this reflection, we find another characteristic of Jesus. He falls into conversation with a Samaritan woman beside a well. One day, Jesus said, Jews would not befriend a Samaritan because of ways in which the everyday focus of the two groups of people had drifted apart during the time of the exile. In Jesus' day, Jews would not befriend a Samaritan. We read, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will, be, will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. That day, Jesus engaged the woman in conversation about the right place and the right way to worship God. He tells her that a time is coming and has now in fact come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father God seeks. 
Nobody is left out of the embrace of his love. And the woman replies, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus is a humble, Torah-abiding Messiah who seeks to include all. He is our shepherd, and we will not want. Goodness and mercy will follow us all of our days and bring us home. continues. See how far it has developed since the promising times of Noah and Abraham, Moses and David. In the Bible, the Christian Bible, we have reached Jesus's last week on earth. And after the Last Supper on which we base the communion part of our recent service, Jesus faces arrest and is put on trial for his life at the trial of Jesus. For the third time Herod spoke, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty, therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to be crucified. This part of the story is important. This trial is important. The facts in this trial are important. Since we see yet another characteristic of the Messiah, it's not just that he is humble, suffers, and dies on a cross, but the writers make it very clear through two Roman characters, Herod, and as we will hear now, a centurion, that Jesus is innocent. From the cross around noon, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurions, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this man was innocent. Hundreds of years before Jesus cried out in a loud voice from the cross, the prophet Isaiah had written of a suffering servant of the Lord. Just who Isaiah was referring to in his text is unclear. It could have been one of the kings. But the children of Israel hear in that promise, prophecy the suffering that awaited them as a people, the exile. The followers of Jesus of Nazareth on the other hand, saw in the life of Isaiah's suffering servant of God the way that Jesus too had lived, faithful to his God and faithful to the Torah. Isaiah wrote, He bore our sorrows and because of our lack of, of repentance, he was pierced, he was crushed, he was punished. 
They did bring us peace and healing through his wounds. They buried him with the wicked as if he were a crook, even though he committed no violence and there was no guile in his mouth. Although he made himself a guilt offering, his descendants will be many. After his agony, God invites his servant to his table. And he took upon himself the sins of many and prayed for his enemies. He suffered for us. Yet even in his suffering, he remained faithful to the Torah, faithful to God and example to us. Words from the prophet Isaiah. Words that were taken up by the early Christians as they considered Jesus' life. Jesus is a humble, Torah-abiding Messiah who seeks to include all, yet suffers and dies, even though he is innocent of his charges. Jesus was laid in a tomb, and three days later, an amazing discovery was made. Two travellers tell the story as they walk to Emmaus. They tell it like this. Now, on the first Easter day, two followers of Jesus were discussing things with each other when Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. We had hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel, they said to the stranger. And what is more, it is the third day since this took place. Some of our women amazed us when they went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Jesus said to these people, these strangers walking to Emmaus, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Remember the prophet Malachi's words. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Those who lived in holy awe before me shall arise, and in their radiance they shall find healing. They will frolic like calves in the pasture after the stable doors are opened. Thus spake the Lord. Then remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, all the statutes and ordinances that I gave to Israel at Sinai. Jesus is a humble, Torah-abiding, suffering Messiah who dies to take away our sins, even though he is innocent, and rises again to bring us all close to the God who never leaves us. So as we come to the end of our reflection, our second reflection for Lent this year, that Jesus died for us and in our place. Let us take some time to reflect in prayer on how Jesus fits into our lives at present. We'll take just a few moments to focus on our own, own prayers and then I will read a reflection from Spill the Beans written in 2020 to help us shape our thoughts for the coming days. We're back on the road to Emmaus, a stranger with two travelers. The two travelers wonder, are you the only one? What are you on about? What's been going on? You mean you haven't heard about so-and-so? Have you been asleep? How often we find ourselves out of the loop how often we think we are the last to know. Except, of course, on that road the stranger knew it all. 
The disciples walking and talking, so immersed in their own thoughts, they did not even notice who it was they were walking with. Sometimes Jesus is in plain sight. Do we see him? What things, he asks. And off they go, giving them, him a verbatim account of what had happened that first Easter day. Can you just imagine the wry smile on his face? But then comes a challenge. A challenge for them, a challenge for us. How slow you are to believe everything the prophets said. And on they walk. And then, later in the action of breaking bread, they finally see, in that oh-so-familiar action, their eyes open. And he is gone again. And they have another story to tell. And now it is our turn. We have another story to tell. It is our turn to open our eyes, to see Jesus, to watch, to think, to share the new story we have, to widen our loop that all might see Jesus for themselves. Amen. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the whole